Moving to the rest of the Republican race, we had the first debate this week and it was viewed by a surprisingly high number of people, 12.8 million, and Vivek Ravaswamy seemed to be the central focus of the debate, with Nikki Haley also landing this great punch. John, I'm glad you, you brought that up. I'm going to address much. each of those right now. This is the false lies of a professional politician. There you have it. Your so you the reality make America is, America less safe. You have no me, foreign policy experience, and it shows. And you know what? The, the foreign policy experience. Emily, what were your takeaways from the debate? I think the fact that it had such high viewership and so many people were interested shows that a lot of Americans really are undecided in this election and they want to learn more about the candidates, which is a very good thing. And they want to actually hear about policy and not just necessarily personality, which also is a very good thing. I also find it interesting that Trump refused to be a part of the debate and it really shows where he stands and how much respect he has for his opposition. He just thinks that he can ride by on this group of people that just loves him. Him, and I don't think that's going to be the case in this election. So it's good to see so many interested parties wanting to watch the debate, caring about the candidates. Mm, Kosha, who do you think improved their standing as a result of the debate? I think, you know, the, the breakout star uh, from what I saw seems to be Vivek Ramaswamy, but not so much because um, it's improved his electability necessarily or that he uh, is really realistically having a shot at winning the nomination or the presidency. I, I think there's a long way to go. There's a lot of, of wood to chop before he gets anywhere in that vicinity. But he's performing a very important role of widening the conversation. Um, you know, I've said this before in the Republican Party, there's this fracturing between the populist wing, uh, the Trump supporters and the establishment wing, and he goes right to those issues issues and, um, you know, forces the conversation in a way that none of the other candidates did. So in that sense, I think he's serving an important role. But um, uh, to me, I think the biggest winner of this actually was Trump. I disagree with Emily over there because his poll, poll numbers just uh, completely go up and he was sort of letting the, the runner up or the varsity team fight it out while he still is 40 plus points ahead from everybody else. Hey, if all publicity is good publicity. All they talked about in the debate was Trump and he wasn't even there. Um, let's return back to Australia and to the out outrageous story from the ABC that I mentioned in my editorial. Students at the Australian Defence Force Academy have said that they felt pressured to not wear their military uniform after receiving an instruction from their commanding officers uh, from the executive part of the ADFA college requiring them to wear um, civilian clothing or purple clothing for wear it purple day and that refusal to do so would be seen as an active protest against LGBTQIA plus people in a way that's not in line with defence policy. Now, it's supposed to be voluntary that you can participate in these things under the policy that Labor's brought in. Kosha, is wearing your military uniform an act of protest? Evidently, uh, if that memo is true and, and if that's what they said, you know, there's two dynamics of this illustrates for me, Amanda. So one is just the collapse of so many institutions, including storied ones like the military or the defense, at the altar of this higher ideology. And that's really what this is about now. It's inclusion of, of, of everybody in that acronym, uh, no matter what. And uh, I think that's what this illustrates. The other quick point I would make, too, is there is really a question here about what the military is for, whether it's here in Australia, whether it's back right. home in my home country, mm. the U.S., is it meant to be a lean, mean defense machine of warriors or is it meant to be a platform for social justice issues? And I think that reckoning um, is going to accelerate because the, the two are contradictory ideas and only one is going to prevail. And, and the answer is obvious. The military is meant to be the former. It's meant to be a lean, mean, defending and fighting machine. And these sorts of measures, um, while they might make people feel woke and it might make them feel included, really does nothing to enhance their capacity to be able to do those important things. Emily, what do you think about this? I mean, it is important that everybody's able to be free from discrimination, but to, in effect, force people to affirm beliefs that they may or may not support under the command of an officer and to face effectively discipline if they refuse to affirm somebody else's sexuality. Is that something that we should be doing in the ADF? 
Yeah, I, I'm with you. I really don't think that a uniform, wearing your uniform makes sense as a form of discrimination. I don't think this is doing a service to LGBTQA plus people because now people are frustrated about it. This has become a talking point. This will increase homophobia, if anything, instead of decreasing it. And I understand the desire of the community uh, to celebrate and to have these days to recognize discrimination from the past. But I think they're just providing opportunities to create more discrimination. And when they're calling things discrimination that really aren't, they're picking a fight where there doesn't need to be one. Yeah, that's a good point.